right. The champ is here. You know it's about that time. Loved by many, hated by a few, respected by all, with second to none. That's right. The best radio podcast from Como to the Congo. If you're in Fort Worth, you know where Como's at. If you're part of the world, which clearly you are, because you're looking at this on FBRN.US, you should know where the Congo's at. And if not, you should ask somebody, somebody. This uh, radio show podcast is, well, it's uh, continuing the success of the other radio shows that you remember in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and you may remember them very well. You may remember... uh, well, Willis Johnson, well, <laughs> you may remember Mr. Johnson and the crooner, KKDA, and you may also remember John Wiley Price when Talk Back with John Wiley Price. And uh, you may also remember us on KHV in Heaven 97. And, uh, well, you know, Robert Ashley, the show over there. Robert Ashley still doing his thing. But this time we're having a community report, if you will, right here, right here as well. And I'd like to also send a shout out to Judge Mary Ellen Hicks, who also had a radio show back in the day as well. So, you know, we want to say uh, and salute those people who also were part of making the Commish Radio Show what it is, because this radio show is a community based show. And as you can see from the screen right above, Gray Vision 2020. That's how we put this show on, that along with uh, well, contributions from guests and maybe possibly you would like to sit right here beside me, right here uh, on the Commission Radio Show. I'd like to send a special shout out to all those people who have been listening uh, across the Commission Nation Network, uh, CNN, the Commission Nation Network, because we're always in your hood. We are CNN, the, well, the Colored Nation Network, I guess that's what someone has referred to it as it is. But this show is not about any color. This show is about justice, justice. And that's why we're talking about justice. We want to send a, a shout out to those people over at the African American Museum where Frank Frazier, Frank Frazier had, uh, well, this excellent, excellent, excellent uh uh, program that we honored uh, Frank Frazier. His uh, his works are on display right now. Manuel Gillespie was a curator for that, and he uh, 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 accumulated a lot of the work that, uh, well, well, you know who Frank Frazier is. So go ahead, and if you don't know who he is, Google him. If, and if you know who he is, also tag him because he's a friend of the Commission Radio Show, and he watches this show as well. I wanted to... Uh, Spend some time with you as well to talk to you about Monday Night Politics at the African American Museum in which, uh, well, I'm one of the sponsors along with uh, various hosts of the uh, various uh, chapters of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated as well, and, and the AKAs and all the Panhellenic Council uh have uh, uh, came together along with the other. I can't name all of the sponsors because if I name some, which I've already did, I'll probably not name some, and they will go ahead and tag themselves on this post. So if you could do that, please do that as well. A Monday Night Politics, place five and place nine of the Dallas City Council, they're having the information session for that. So contact uh, James Belt and Molly Belt of uh, the Dallas Examiner, and uh, they uh, have that. Do we have that flyer for that up there? Let's put that flyer up there so they'll be able to see that flyer. And uh, as we are looking at that, and uh, as we got this feedback from my uh, trusty, trusty, trusty uh, telephone that that I'm able to go ahead and see that uh, Bobby Mitchell has joined us as well. He said the champ is here. He's sharing, and Joyce Singletary is watching as well with us. We want you to uh, share with uh, your friends because we have already capped out at 5,000. That's the reason why we started uh, putting this uh, broadcast on various platforms such as Roku. So go ahead and uh, look us up on Roku on this TV network where we're there, and also uh, LinkedIn. Be my friend on LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter, Ed Gray 1906 
and on Instagram, A Gray1906 there. So that's what we got going on there. Man, without any water, man. You know, but you know, that's what we're we're talking about. We uh uh I gotta catch my breath on that one, man. I went through all that. All that. So we like to go ahead and, and uh talk a, a little bit about what else we have going on in the community. The second half of this show, we will have Michael Todd, legal standpoint with Michael J. Todd. He'll be here during the second hour. So he takes over. We got lawyers in the house right now. They're here to make sure I don't say anything wrong. I'm always saying something, so they want to make sure I don't say anything wrong. So we have lawyers here today. So uh, I always have to consult with my lawyers about that. We uh, also uh, like to say as well that if you have any local music, uh, because of Facebook, uh, Facebook has... uh, uh, you know how they are. You know you put on your your your, uh, your feed. You say I don't own the rights to this music, and you know you hope they don't turn you off. Well, they always turn us off. Why? Because they're actually listening to this show. So I uh, sent back to Facebook. They didn't put me in Facebook jail, but they put me in Facebook timeout. You know. So what they do is they make sure that it, it this doesn't get broadcast out. That's the reason why I started developing a, a YouTube channel, so I can go ahead and immediately download this and then put it on YouTube. But in the meantime, we want you to share this. Share it as Bobby Mitchell is doing now, to share it and, and share and share alike. So that's what we're going to be uh, doing as well. A. Macy O. Smith, as we wait for our first call of the call in, uh, which will be Carmina Barnett, uh, formerly of Heaven 97, KHVN, where I uh, was over at Heaven 97 for a little while as well, at, in, in dual capacity here uh, at uh, uh, Fishbowl Radio Network and WFAA. So on time, because guess what? Carmina Barnett ran KHVN, so I know she's right here on time. We got her? All right. Hello, Carmina. Hello, how are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I'm just, as you can tell, I was bragging on you, and I'd already did the call letters for Heaven 97 and everything, and I I appreciate (laughs) uh, working with you as well over with uh, uh, Heaven 97, 970 on our dial. I sure do miss Heaven 97. I really do. Oh, do we all? We really do. It's a big part of our community. Right. You you still are a big part of our community. As a matter of fact, you was one of my bosses <laughs> over there. So tell me what you're doing with yourself and tell us about the African American Museum. Well, of course, I am still doing radio. That's just something I cannot let go. But uh, along with that, I've been blessed with the opportunity to be a part of the African American Museum here in Dallas and working in the capacity with the development department. And we have just some amazing things that are happening. So what do we have going on? Well, to start, we've got an amazing exhibit that is opening up this week. And I'm very excited about it. It's a South African exhibit. This is the first time that it's going to be here in the United States. And we are honored to be able to host it there at the African Museum. And so, yeah, that's going to be kicking off on Wednesday. So we're inviting people out to that. And then something I really want to key in on is the Amacio Smith Community Service Brunch. Right. We're hosting that at the Dallas Marriott Suites, and that's going to be on April 29th. And we're inviting everybody to come out. We're celebrating volunteers, uh, just recognizing them for their amazing, outstanding service, which is something we love to do there at the museum. And so I want to invite the community out to be a part of it. We have great tickets, great information. They can just go to our website and see all of that good stuff. So just kind of giving you the quick overview of it. All right. Okay. <laughs> Angelo, put that uh, A. Maceo Smith flyer up there so the folks at home can, can mm-hmm. hear it. And uh, tell us who who A. Maceo Smith is and tell us who is going to be honored uh, on April 29th at 10 a.m. Well, I'll tell you this much. <laughs> they are special community servants. Unfortunately, I have 
moved away from where I have all of the information, so I don't want to give names and then miss out on anyone. But it, it's just something special. We love the opportunity, again, to celebrate those in the community who are making an impact, which is all of our goal is to make sure that we're making an impact. And we know Amacio Smith was a pioneer civil rights leader right here in the Dallas area, so it's our honor to be able to give this award in his name. I mean, he did so many amazing things. He was known as Mr. Civil Rights and Mr. Organization right here in the Metroplex. So, again, an amazing person to honor with this award. Okay, and he has a, he has a building downtown named after him as well. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. we'd like to thank you for calling in. We just wanted to make sure uh, that uh, we have someone from the African American Museum and want to make sure we uh, uh, get folks out. Uh, they can still get their tickets, right? Absolutely. They can go to our website. It's aamdallas.org. And can I just add this real quick? Okay. I want to say thank you to you for making oh, wow. such a major impact in our community. As you mentioned, we served together there at Heaven 97, but even beyond that, you've always been a voice and been on the forefront of really keeping our community connected, keeping them informed. And so I just want to take a moment and appreciate you for that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I didn't see that coming at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's why I said, oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm glad Absolutely. I speak, I'm glad yes, I speak to you every time I come into the museum. <laughs> So I appreciate it. Well, hopefully see you soon. Of course, the launch this week, so hopefully we'll get a chance to see you. That'll work. Will do. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, All right. All right. That's how we do it on the Commission Nation Network, where we uh, make sure that people are connected in the community and making sure that you know what's going on. If you have any, uh, I'm going to leave it up to you. I'm, I'm opening this up. Uh, to you. We want to make sure that uh, uh, community <laughs> advertising is done, if you will. If you happen to know of any events that I need to just go ahead and chime in and, and put on my storylines like I have on Facebook uh, where I combine it with music and everything, go ahead and uh, email what you want me to have a storyline about and i do it for you. Yes, you right there. And the email address is E-E-G-R-A-Y 62 at A-T-T dot net. Now you got it. Now if you start spamming me, well, you know, I'm going to block you. That's all it's going to be about. But, you know, I'm going to say it again. E-E-G-R-A, you know, just for people in Oak Cliff who pronounce the R's as R-A, we'll, we'll say that. A-Y 62 at A-T-T dot net. So that being said, we're going to go ahead and put that uh, uh, flyer up. And, and I know someone's going to say, why did you say that about Oak Cliff? Oak Cliff, that's my hood. I can talk about Oak Cliff. I'm from the hood. So that being said, you didn't think I was grew up in SMU, did you? Come on, now. Give me a break. Angelo, you got the A. O. Smith flyer? Yes, sir. Right, let's put that up, and let's uh, put some of the uh, uh, local music we have uh, from, uh, well, Joyce Spencer, I believe we got Saxo Funk on tap. All right, thank you for tuning in to Commission Radio Show. We'll be right back. Still alive, man. 
Saxo Funk by, well, wow, Joyce Spencer. She's doing that saxophonist. You know, women can do any and everything they want to do. You know, they can play a saxophone. They can be attorneys. So they can be judges. They can be lawyers, Supreme Court justices. They can be all of those things and more. And they also can be a guest on the Commission Radio Show. I have uh, Michelle McKinney. How you doing? I'm doing fine. It's been a little while since you've been on the show. It has. Last time you sneaked up on me on the show. This time we, we saw you coming this time. So, hey, uh, what do you think about the show, how we did it? You, you saw the whole show from beginning to where you're sitting at right now. So what do you think about it? I like it. I like the fact that people have the opportunity to uh, inform the community about upcoming events. I think it's very important. Well, that's good. That's good. That's why we have you here as well. Now, you ran for office. What did you run for? I ran for a family court judge, district judge in Dallas County. Okay. How would you do? I did not win, but I did very well. It was a write-in candidacy, and I had over 18,000 votes, which was beyond my wildest dreams, actually. 18,000 <laughs> votes. I'll take credit for 17,999. You can take credit for that one. <laughs> but no, no, but thank you uh, for coming on the show and congratulations on it. That is uh, outstanding, 18,000. What did you learn from that campaign? What I learned from that campaign is how important it is, uh, how, you know, how important it is. Sometimes we take it for granted the roles that we have as attorneys and we're advocates and how we have the power to make change. And there are a lot of people in the community who don't have that voice. And um, so what I learned is that it's important to cultivate those relationships. Like right now, what I'm committed to is going back to these communities and organizations that I went to asking for their vote, but going back now, not with any motive other, mm -hmm. other than to just get to know them and find some causes that I can be passionate about mm -hmm. and see if I can use my gift in a way that elevates other people. Now, why did you decide to become a, a lawyer, an attorney? Uh, well, initially I majored in social work in undergrad and I realized that I wasn't going to have the power to make change as I would as a family law or an attorney, period. So where did you go to school at? I went to Rutgers University for undergrad and then I went to the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville uh, for my law school degree. What's the difference between Rutgers and University of Arkansas? Well, <laughs> outside of the fact one is obviously in New Jersey, folks, you didn't know I knew where that was at, right? New Jersey, right? Right. Well, it was a very interesting time. When I was at Rutgers, that's when Ray Rice was there. The team was very good. There was a lot of uh, pride and excitement about that team. The entire community really dry cleaners had 
the signs up there and everything, and it got to the point where you had to go through a lottery system just to be able to go to a game as a student. Um, but, you know, it, I met some good professors. It's a very special time in my heart because that was, well, first of all, I was a uh, athlete myself. What did you play? Um, I did track and field. I'm a state champion in shot put and discus. And what was so special about going to college was to find out that I wasn't just an athlete, but that I had intelligence as well. You know, I had always been known uh, for my athletic ability. And so, and when I first got to college, uh, it was very difficult because that, you know, people just didn't focus on that with me. Uh, but I got to find out that I was more than just an athlete. And, and it was actually when you asked me, why did I become a, a mm -hmm. lawyer? The truth is a professor saw something in me at Rutgers and said, I just, he said, kid, you just need to keep going. You've got something. Now, New Jersey, mm -hmm. Arkansas. <laughs> I mean, you're on the, where are you from? I'm from Jersey. Okay. Yeah. Why Arkansas then? Well, I got a scholarship, and so that's very Okay, important. that'll do it right there. That'll do it right there. Yeah. That, that'll do it right there. So when you, when you got to Arkansas, did you have, like, culture shock? I, mean, I did have. They had something called uh, tumbleweed. It's a lot more developed now than it was. You know, Arkansas, uh, Fayetteville is a college town, but you, you fly into Bentonville, and basically what's out there was Walmart at the time. Um, and when I got there, I was like, what is this? Wait a minute. Like, you, Fayetteville is in, well, the University of Arkansas is in Fayetteville. It's in Fayetteville. How far is Fayetteville from Little Rock? Mm, I don't even remember. I, I is it far? Two, two uh, well, okay, it's two hours yeah, away. That's yeah, a long time. Don't uh, quote me on that. Two, uh, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I'm not on, we're not in the courtroom. We're not being exact as that. But two, two hours, Fayetteville, and then that's like in the country, ain't it? Well, my joke is that people, well, I need to be careful, right? But, they, you know, the students were telling me, I got to take you to Little Rock because I was, I was a city kid, you know, <laughs> and looking at, is this all there is? And uh, which, what I need to say is secretly, I actually fell in love with Fayetteville, Arkansas, Ozark Mountains, Eureka Springs. It's a beautiful place to raise a family, to study, and I try to go back when I can. All right. I have a special love for Arkansas. That's where my okay. folks are from. They're from uh, Texarkana. So, okay. so, so, yep. Yeah. So now from uh, Fayetteville to Dallas. Yeah. How'd you get to Dallas? Well, um, when I was in Arkansas, um, it was challenging because I didn't really have a church. Well, first of all, law school was a very difficult time. I had my daughter with me um, as a single mother in law school. Wow. And um, I had been listening to T.D. Jakes. Um, and we had an ice storm in Arkansas uh, while I was in law school. And over the radio, they said that the power could be out from anywhere to seven to 10 days. And we're like, seven to 10 days? And that was dynamic for me because in New Jersey, mm -hmm. we went to school in the snow. Like, we still went. Um, and so to hear that something could happen that would have us um, with no power for seven to 10 days, one of the girls who went to law school with me invited me to come to Dallas because that's where she was from. And that's where T.D. Jake's church was from. So I was like, yeah, cool, um, I wanna go. And so I came and I went to the Potter's house and you know, I just felt like once I, I really, you know, he has been very impactful in my life. But the bottom line is when I graduated from law school, I didn't have an offer. And it was very expensive to try to go back to New Jersey. And so really it's a faith walk. I felt like if I got under that word, going to the Potter's house and listening to T.D. Jake's, that things would fall in place, and they have. So faith is very important to you. Yeah. And you put you walked out on faith. I did walk out on faith. And uh, you're an attorney here in Dallas. How long have you been in Dallas now? Eleven years. Eleven years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what is your specialty? Uh, family law is my specialty. Uh, and more specific than that, um, I like to work with fathers. Fathers. Yes. Um, you know, there's a myth out here that says that, that there are deadbeat dads, and, and I'm sure there are, but by majority, that is not the case. Uh, just, you know, just random, the majority of the clients that I had in my early practice were men, and it were, was men who wanted to stand up and just be a part of their child's life, and for one reason or another, many times because of the way that relationship with that mother that they share the child with ended, they're not able to see the child. And then that coupled with the way some of the laws are, 
or the way the law is administered, many men find themselves not able to have as much time with their child as they'd like to. And so I'm a huge advocate for that. Why? Well, maybe because I'm a daddy's girl. Maybe okay. because I know what's possible. Now, have you received any pushback from women because you... Well, I always give that disclaimer that... Um, Child I mean, obviously, men will say, okay, it's about time somebody look look out for us, you know. Well, here's what's interesting about what's men. Men have the man that they love. Um, they have sons who have the same experience. So I feel like this whole issue with child support, child custody, um, every family is affected in some way or another. It could happen to your grandson. So it's not so much as to be about men's rights. It's just about human rights. So how do you, you know, grand? Let's talk about grandparents, because okay. it seems like a lot of grandparents are, are involved in, in, in raising uh, their grandchildren. Yes. Uh, do grandparents have rights? Um, not inherently. Um, something has to happen. The belief is that if a man and woman separate, um, the father is supposed to get some kind of visitation. In, in Texas, they usually get standard visitation, which is every other weekend. And the belief is when that person has their visit, their family would see the child during that parent's time. The time when grandparents get rights is something like when one of the parents is incarcerated or maybe CPS comes along and has removed the child from that environment with their parents. Then grandparents at that point, because the parents are not available, that's when they have rights. But if there's two healthy parents, then a grandparent come in, can't come in and sue for custody or something like that. Okay, so let me see if I got this right. The, if someone goes to jail mm -hmm. and the grandparent wants to see the child, right. then they can they can have the right to see the child? Yes. They, I mean, hopefully you can just go to that mother and say, hey, because they would have already had an existing relationship. But if they do not, and if mom says no, a grandparent can go to court and petition the court for visitation. I got one word to say about that. Damn. That's real. I didn't know that. It happened. I didn't know that. No, nobody says that. Yeah, That's the reason why you guys come that, to this show yeah, to hear that kind of thing. There's a presumption that parents act in the best interest of the child, but there's also a presumption that um, that child can benefit from both sides of their family. That should be that right. way. Okay. Now, uh, in family court, uh, you, you practice in family court. How many family courts do we have? We have seven family courts in Dallas County. Seven in Dallas County? Seven districts, uh huh? Okay. So when a person goes to family court and, and you, you're dealing with fathers and, and, and rights, and I understand that there's an organization, Texas Fathers for Equal Rights. Right. Right. Uh, what, what do they do? Well, Fathers for Equal Rights is an organization that I have volunteered for in the past. And you know, one of the things they do is because the Attorney General plays a very interesting role in um, the parent-child relationship. They will go after the child support. So um, in a scenario where, uh, let's just say mom has custody of the child and, and she needs to get child support, the Attorney General will represent that mother for free to get the child support started. But on the flip side, there are issues for the father where maybe he's not getting the visitation well, the attorney general doesn't represent the father for free to help him get visitation. So that's what one of the things that Father for Equal Rights does is assist uh, the fathers uh, to navigate through the legal system so that they can bring a case and, and get the uh, child visitation that they're entitled to. That's one of the things they do. Another thing that they do is they'll help people with the forms. They can't go into court and represent them, but what Fathers for Equal Rights does is recruit volunteers such as myself. But either way, it's sometimes the regular person could represent themselves in court if they just had good information, and that's something that Fathers for Equal Rights facilitates. So how long have we had the Fathers for Equal Rights? Fathers for Equal Rights has been around since I started practicing law, so I'd have to say at least nine of my 11 years I've known about Fathers for Equal Rights. Okay. Let's talk about child support. Does child support ever go away? Does it go away? Right, because I, I, you know, okay. I, I, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm just saying, I know of people who say that they're paying for a child and the child is like 30-something years old. Well, that's because they have some kind of arrears. 
So the only way oh, okay. is number one, or there's the child has a disability. So in the state of Texas, the child support obligation ends at the eight time of at the age of eighteen and when the child graduates high school, 18 and high school. So if the child turns 18 in January, but they don't graduate until May, that child support obligation continues until the child graduates. But in order for it to go past that threshold, the child had to be found to have a disability uh, while the child is under 18, and then it could go on actually indefinitely at that point. But if the average scenario is that a man has gotten behind or a person has gotten behind in their child support and the only real chance they have to start to catch up on it is once the normal child support ends at 18. So just think about if somebody had to pay $500 a month in child support, they can't afford to address any arrears. All they might be able to give is the 500. But when the child turns 18 and that current obligation it becomes stops. zero, then they start to they pay the 500 arrears. or the 200 towards whatever. So it goes to owed. it goes yeah. to the uh, to the mother yeah. and, until they until it's zero mm -hmm. or many times one of the things or the benefit of hiring a lawyer is to try to facilitate to see if you can settle on an amount you know like it doesn't have if you owe seven thousand six hundred and ninety nine dollars if mom is willing to take twenty five hundred as a lump sum there's a mechanism to zero out that child support if the parties are in agreement so you can zero out huh? yes as long as none of the money is owed to the attorney general you can you, the person can forgive the money see a lot of men listen to this show that they they're gonna like you, and some other people they may not like you. That's the reason why I asked. I mean, do you get do you catch flat? Yeah, yeah. Many bad, many bad things have happened uh, with the attorney general's office. That whole child support experience, especially if you go in there not represented, because the biggest mistake people make who have a child support obligation is that. If when child support first starts, what if you were making $20 an hour, $25 an hour, and what if that changes? You become unemployed, you start to make $12 an hour. You have a right to go back to court and do what's called a modification, asking the judge to lower your child support based on what your new income actually is. And that is an, that's the number one reason why people fall behind in child support in the first place, is because they're being obligated to an amount that they can no longer live up to for one reason or another, and they don't know that they need to come back to court and ask the court to change it. Well, any other changes in, in the, the family law? Well, one, other, one other thing that's interesting that I'd like to mention is the situation with incarceration. I say a lot of the funny things about the Attorney General's office, but one thing that they did do is that if somebody is incarcerated and they have a current child support obligation at the moment that they are incarcerated, they can petition the court to stay their child support. Their child support can become zero while they're incarcerated, so they're not stacking up all that debt, all that arrears, while they're in jail or prison and have no ability to address it. So that's an important change. So that's a, a change that's just just got started? I would say within the past uh, four, four or five years. Past four or five years? Yeah. So before it that, given. It was not before given. that, if you were in jail, a person was incarcerated, they were still liable for that? That is correct, because what we have here is there is no such thing as zero child support. Um, somebody who doesn't work um, and you are brought to court for child support, the judge will treat you as if you're making minimum wage, whether you're making it or not. So nobody has zero. Okay, so somebody's unemployed or somebody's okay. basically uh, working off the books, so to speak. They have one of those jobs that they work off the books. Well, we try yeah. to go after those folks off the books, but if we can't prove it, yes. yeah. Um, the minimum is, is a minimum wage order, so they treat you as minimum wage is 725, whatever the number is. The child support is based on that, whether you have it or not. Okay. But what's different is if you're incarcerated, then that doesn't hold. You can ask the court to make your child support zero. Now, a person's in jail, counselor, mm -hmm. or in prison, so they petition well, the, the court because they say, look, I'm in prison. I'm in Huntsville right now. I can't pay this. So I wonder how often that actually happens. I mean, there's I no, no candidate. I mean, I don't know yeah. that they know of it. And I don't know for certain, to be honest with you, if they, what if they let the five years go by, they get all that arrears within the five years, and when they come out and have the ability to go in, will they look retroactively? I don't, I don't know that right. they do. Retroactively, I, yeah. I, I don't know that they do. 
you'd have to have that petition on file with the court. Right, because if someone gets out and they say, well, I'm out, and then they start working, if they could get a job, because sometimes you can't get a job once you're in, and that's another poor, uh, portion of our system that we have in America. So, it, it, so you're fortunate enough to get a job, and then someone starts garnishing your wages then. Is that yeah, and my hope is that's when I, you kind of try to mediate with that mother who's been holding the, all the responsibility while that person's been gone, in our example, uh, and because she knows you don't have it, and hope that you guys could work out a number that both of you could live with. Okay. I mean, that's the hope. All right. Any other comments you want to make while we're here? I know this has been somewhat abbreviated because we covered uh, what's in the news earlier. Well, just what's in the news. Um, I, I wasn't really going to <laughs> come on, comment from that nature because I was watching your show the whole Tennessee mm -hmm. Free thing. Um, but I, I just I have to be careful just with yeah, some things that I yeah, do that I can't. But, you know, what's important is, you know, we've come a long way but we have a long ways to go right. when it comes to, because we talk about it's not about skin color, it's about justice. But even in the family law arena, um, minorities still today many times get a different experience because of the bigger issue. Because mm -hmm. um, it's just like you're saying with, you know, with the CPS case or, it still comes back to uh, the pressures that's put on somebody. You know, we talked about the person who gets out of jail and he's got this child support obligation and, and the problems with that is he comes out he's got this felony he can't get a many times he can't get a good job right and so that's what causes him to be tempted to go back to whatever that old behavior was that put him in this position in the first place or even if he's trying to do something he can't get the job because of the record and here comes all the child support obligations it puts um people in a place of defeat and that's what I encounter many times. It's so much more than just being a lawyer. It's about being a counselor. It's about speaking life into people. It's, it's, a, it's what we, the opportunities that I get um, are, are very interesting. And I just understand that what I may take for granted is, is, some, is something very important and vital to someone else. Just coming into a room, somebody encounters me at Fathers for Equal Rights, and I'm able to say, don't give up. Here's what I can do. Have you tried this? And give people hope. That's what this show's about, giving yeah. people hope. Yeah. So we thank you for coming on the show and everything, okay. and we want you to come back. Okay. We want you to come back. Uh, yeah. how, how, can they, how can they reach you? Yeah, so um, since um, the campaign, I have now become a senior attorney at Godwin and Bowman, which is a very prestigious law firm downtown. And I am in the family law section. And one of the things I've been tasked to do is to come out in this community um, and engage with some of the very people that I met along the campaign trail, let them know about what we're offering. I'm out here to help uh, different organizations, sororities, churches, um, nonprofit organizations that need sponsors, um, that's something that I have the ability to do. Um, one of the goals for me is to offer resources to people who have a well thought out objective and are gonna actually uh, walk the walk, we're here to help. And so that's something I, I'm excited to do in the community and what I wanna come back and talk about more. Okay, we wanna put you on the circuit here, okay. uh, have you come back uh, uh, again and again and again, you know, I mean, you know, let, <laughs> Let's make it work and everything uh, because we have a, a, a lot to talk about. We can get into more specifics uh, about uh, the law. It's, it's always changing. Uh, but you gave us a, a brief overview, and you covered a lot of things in, in the time that you were here, uh, things that I was taking notes. I was just taking notes. So I appreciate you for, for coming on. And I appreciate you giving me that opportunity. All right. Thank All you. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Angelo. That was a pretty good show, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep, it was. It was. So let's uh, play some uh, uh, nice music on out. Uh, let's have some more of uh, Joyce Spencer, who is our musician for the hour. If you happen to have some uh, MP3s that you can send, uh, we would love to have them here because, as you know, we highlight local news and music because you're listening to the Commission Nation Network because we're always in your hood. The best radio show from Como to the Congo. It, why? Because what? The champ is here. All right. All right, Angelo.